Yeah, you gotta call it to order first. <laughs> call the order, move the chair. Okay, call the committee meeting to order with my froggy voice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I have quiet, please? Hello, everybody. Oh, there's a new chair. Excuse me. You want to chat outside? Madam Chair, I have received one other business item in advance of the meeting. It pertains to a reminder to local real estate agents and was briefed by Councillor Zerillo. Okay. Sorry? By, briefed by Councillor Zerillo. Reminder to Public. local real estate agents. Wants to remind them not to allow more than one secondary suite or something. That was an email she sent. Oh, I didn't get there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving to item one. Okay. Is there I, anything else? Uh, no. no. Okay, moving on. Item one is the minutes of the Counseling Committee meeting held on Monday, February 6, 2017. Recommendation to approve. So moved. Second. All in favor? Both carried. Second. Madam Chair, I'd like to note that item two, the delegation from the Evergreen Cultural yes. Center, was removed at the request of uh, the delegation. So we'll move on to item three. Thank you very much. Item three. Item three is a delegation from Millard Mail School PAC. I'd like to invite Ms. Jennifer Martin to please come forward. Ms. Perfect. Martin will be speaking to a request for the installation of a crosswalk. Thank you. Welcome. And I would like to invite Gabriella. Come with me. So Gabrielle is one of our students at Millard, and she's going to start off our very short presentation. Okay. Can I remind you, you have five minutes. I will be quick. And I will ask you to speak into that little microphone, dear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A little bit closer, that's best. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council, for taking the time to listen to us. We're here today to ask you for a much-needed crosswalk near our school. Many of us feel unsafe crossing the street without a crosswalk. Therefore, we created a petition to show you how passionate we are about this issue. We hope you are open-minded when watching the following presentation. Thank you. I will steal that now. So I will be as quick as I can. Uh, I'm going to start with a quick look at our school population. So we have 381 regular students, and in addition to that, we have about 90 families that participate in the Strong Start program on a drop-in basis. So the Strong Start program is hosted within the middle school, and it involves children from ages zero to five and their families. Is it too close or too far? Oh, I could probably be loud enough that we could all hear me without the mic. <laughs> Um, and a quick reminder that Ecole Millard is a dual stream school, which is, means English and French. So that means that the local population that comes to the school to take English education is there, but they are joined by a dual stream population of French students who come from all over the catchment. So here we go. Here is a quick look at the uh, surrounding area of the school. Uh, the green area there, Rochester Park, is the park that we share with the city. Millard Middle School is right there underneath Rochester Avenue. And right up the road is Rochester Elementary. In this blank spot right here where I have foolishly forgotten to mark at the top of Laval, we are also joined by a traditional school, a traditional learning academy, their private school. And of course they have a mostly a population that has to drive to get to their school as well. So when we move on from that, this is a further view out. One of the recommendations that we've received at the school is that we change our traffic patterns for dropping off the kids. And as you can see, here is Millard. The only, act, the only real street access is Rochester Avenue up at the top. If you want to drop your kids on the south side of the school, you will have to go around down to Care, come down Brunetch, come all the way up Marmont, and then come down Rochester. Because none of these little streets connect conveniently. Laval Street does connect, but as you can see, it's a double-sided, old-fashioned, built in the 1960s street, right? And there is no parking or sidewalk on one side of the road. And if you are coming up the recommended way along Rochester, you turn down this way. So you're already on the wrong side of the street. Your kids will still have to cross the street, which will now be crowded with parents. This is the back access into the school. There is no exit out of the school. And there's a lovely lady here who has a dog training academy and a three foot high fence. So the parents are not a big fan of that exit. This is our secondary back set, uh, entrance into the school. It is also double sided, but with, oh, thank you. Thank you. It is also a very narrow access, and this has the parking lot that's up at the top, 
no turnaround. So this here fits about two cars at a time. So one of the things that's changed in the last little while, and since we did have someone from transportation come out to visit us, is uh, they, when they came to do their assessment, uh, they came in the morning. And Millard itself has a very enthused, one of the largest music programs in the Tri-Cities. And so more than a third of the students in the school are involved in the music programs. So when they came to observe, what they were seeing was a staggered arrival time. So a third of the school arrives at 7.30, another 80 to 90 kids arrive for the breakfast program shortly after that, and then the last portion of the kids arrive. So half of the kids arrive in a staggered way. So an observation in the morning didn't really give an accurate picture of what it's like to see all of the kids when they're leaving. And it also doesn't reflect the one day a week when the kids arrive late. So four mornings a week, the kids arrive at the same time, 825. One morning a week, the school district has said that we have the kids arrive at 855, which also crosses the time that all the parents from Strong Start are arriving. So, oh, sorry, I missed a point there. Uh, with the new construction on the beautifully improved Rochester Park, which we're all looking forward to, uh, it also takes away a chunk of our parking because now instead of having the two, uh, the one driveway leading out, we're now going to have two driveways leading out. And of course, we'll have to have a small easement on each side of those driveways so that people don't park right in front of them. So here is a perfect, actually, example of how the school looks when there's no one there. But this doesn't really reflect how it will look in the morning. So the kids leave the school, and what we'd like is here is our proposed location for the crosswalk, right there. Because right here is where the kids come from all of the parents that drop them off and the bus stop. They cross at Goyer Court, and this is where they try and cross. Right now, there's no crosswalk there. This is where we'd like to have one. And they come down here. There is the option for them to take this crosswalk here, but it already is full of the kids who come out of the traditional school and take their bus to go home. So if our kids take this bus stop, they have a chance of getting a seat on the bus. If they take this one, they don't. So the kids will naturally prefer to go to that bus stop at the top of the street. Kids like to sit. So this is the spot where we don't have parking at all in front of the school. So as I was saying, the recommendation has been that we pull in and drop on this south side of the street. The red spots there are the ones that are blocked off and can't have parking. So as you can see, that one here is our bus stop. This is a fire hydrant. This is a driveway. This is the new driveway. Those are the bus stops. And that there is an access from the newly daylighted Rochester Park and the stream that's been brought up, and there's this beautiful new path, but there's no way also for the people that are using this path to access the other side of the street safely. So if we come up here, that is the continuation right there of the new path. So this leaves a spot for about eight parents to park. And as you can guess, with 400 kids being dropped off in the morning, that is not adequate. What we'd like to be able to do is safely use the other side of the street and have a crosswalk for the kids to be able to be dropped off there. They can walk. Also for the kids, and we have a large population of kids that come by bus that get dropped up here and have them safely be able to use a crosswalk there. Uh, this is a much better picture of what the crosswalk will look like than my red little line that was in the previous drawing and also reflects this is the old uh, c before construction. Yes, right. So this was our request. We have already actually met with Dan Mooney, who's the head of transportation. He came out and has agreed to do another survey for us, both in the morning and in the afternoon. But I think we all felt that it was very important that we come here to talk to you at City Council because our parents are very concerned. We have had... At this point, the recommendation that we should try and cross at the natural unmarked crossing, which is already there at the corner of Goyer Court, which is where our proposed location is. But many of us have already seen our kids almost get hit by cars. So that would be, I think, a sign to us as a school community that there is a commitment to protecting the kids. There's a commitment to, as a community and as a city, saying this is important to show that we recognize this is where the kids are, 
and that their choices of where they cross the road reflect a natural break in traffic and something that we can use to protect them. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Richard. First of all, thank you very much. Um, during our committee meetings, uh, our acting mayor chairs, I, I take chair council meetings, uh, but I do thank you very much. I, I used to be president of DPAC. Uh, yes. A couple of decades ago, well, a decade ago, and traffic safety at the time was uh, the one of the major issues in the community. We've done a lot of work on traffic safety since then, um, but at the same time, we, we don't council doesn't design our road network. We rely on people who have engineering degrees to come in, and they, they can analyze things. And are, well, I really appreciate uh, the work that you put into this. Um, we rely on their advice. I've been actually to this particular site uh, for the morning and for the afternoon several times, and I've witnessed exactly what you're describing. Um, and one of your sentences, though, was that if we should, if we, if we're committed, we will put in the crosswalk to protect the children. Um, crosswalks don't protect children. Uh, visibility of the the pedestrians and predictability of the pedestrians is what protects children. And unfortunately, there are places where crosswalks exist, and they make it less safe because now the kids think they're safe because mm -hmm. they're in a crosswalk, and the parents still can't see them. Um, as well, we we see mid-block crosswalks where. Um, the one at Element, Monday Elementary, for example, that's an elementary school, parents dropping off on the wrong side. We've just put in a mid-block crosswalk to accommodate them, and they'll still cross 10 meters away. And they'll be teaching their children that the crosswalk is optional, but you can cross anywhere along here in between stops traffic and that sort of thing. And then we're, that's, those are the ones that just scare the hell out of me because, you know, middle school students are focused on getting across the street, but not necessarily mm -hmm. if, if we teach them that the crosswalk is a safe place. That's uh, yeah. Kids always have the impression that once they're in the crosswalk, they have a magical force field. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I think here you're right that we do see parents allowing their kids to cross in the middle of the road. Uh, part of that, of course, is that there is no option other than, you know, half a block away or half a block down. Um, my biggest concern, of course, is the unsupervised kids who are coming from the bus stop, and so they're crossing the road without a crosswalk. So they would be naturally using that spot. That's the ones that those kids who have nobody to look out for them in the morning that are using. And I would love to have a crosswalk there. That would be the spot they cross at. Their principal has already committed to being out there in the morning and <clears throat> making sure that we develop that habit as a community to make sure that we're safe on both sides, right? Thank you. Oh, absolutely. you? absolutely. I just yeah. uh, I just want to make it clear that if, for example, their analysis <clears throat> suggests that we can't safely install one in one location, it's not because they don't care about the kids. It, it is definitely because Sorry. they really care about the kids. Yes, I, I didn't I didn't mean to imply that that was. No, the case. It wasn't. Yeah. yeah. As long as everyone's clear, we're all we're all working toward the same goal, and, and I yes. And, and again, I do want to thank Dan uh, Dan Mooney for coming out because oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we've got to move on here. Sorry. So this will obviously go to Mr. Mooney and staff to deal with. But if there's any other input from any other council member at this time, Terry. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for coming in today. Um, I was also involved in traffic initiatives through DPAC, and I was recently at Millard with the Haste Group for the school walkability, the school routes for school, and I know that this keeps coming up, and I was going to actually talk about the same things that Richard just mentioned, yeah. because I've also talked, asked about the mid-block crosswalks, and my children went to Monday Road and all that, so my questions, though, I think you covered it off. I drove by again this weekend, and I know there is a crosswalk. I was thinking from the kids walking from the east, mm -hmm. they can cross at Schoolhouse. Yes. From the kids walking from the west, they can cross at Laval. Yeah. And then I wondered, there's not that many kids. Goye is a tiny little cul-de-sac. And where are all these kids coming from, from the path? So I was thinking, where are all these kids coming from that need to cross mid-walk? Yeah. But you cleared it up with yeah. there's a lot of parents at the school that drive middle school age kids and, and as much as range. we encourage them to you know walk if possible you know some of them live 20 25 minutes away and right, that's because it's not. french immersion yeah. and strong start you said and the yeah. bus so i'm clear now yeah there's a lot of pedestrians being dropped off there's a high percentage of parents that drive for this school yeah very high because okay. of that so that's it so, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my question um, was, I was on the list, so I'll, mine is directly for staff. I keep bringing this up. I see Mr. Mooney, our resident genius, in, in the back there. Um, when I go to the States, I often see stop signs, especially at T intersections, and they have lights around them. And 
so no matter where you're coming from, that that light is always continuing. <laughs> And I think they're very useful. You can't miss them. And they're usually used at an intersection like uh, Goye and that when there is people are who are coming along Rochester aren't thinking that there might be a turn or something because it's not that obvious. So I would like a staff to look into, not just for this location, but perhaps others, for the stop signs or crosswalk signs that are actually lit around the sign that draws attention to it. Thank you. Brent. Thank you very much. Um, I drive bus for transit. I do the route <laughs> coming there after 8.30 in the morning. Not a lot of kids I have when I come, because I'm coming down schoolhouse onto Rochester, yeah. dropping kids off. I have maybe three or four coming off, this, off the transit bus in the morning at the 8.30, 8.35 yeah. time that range. My question though is, you, if, if we put a crosswalk and they do decide, and the mid blocks do scare me because <laughs> they're not as noticeable or understandable for drivers coming through. Yes. But what we, we, we've done in a lot of other areas at Ranch Park and everything, to make the kids visible, because parents will park right up to the crosswalk, <coughs> and then what's going to happen is the kids, when they step out, they can't be seen. So what yes. we wind up doing, we put up a coned area, so we wind up taking back more parking away to make the, the crosswalk more visible, and parents aren't parking up to it because they will. Mm -hmm. So I, you showed them that, but you do realize by putting a crosswalk, you're going to reduce... Yes, that parking. was one of the conversations that we had with Dan, was he was explaining that if there was a crosswalk there, that they would be putting, like, a, a jutting out into traffic to make yes. sure that it was obvious that it was, yeah. So I think sacrificing one car worth of parking on either side would be an acceptable compromise, probably. And I say, from my perspective, I, well, we could look at a crosswalk, and I know there's... The, my biggest problem down there is the parents and their driving habits. Parents stopping in the middle of the road, laying their kids out. I've had driving down there, I've had people pull UEs right in front of me and my bus coming down there. Yep. And so, I mean, there the dangers there sometimes, and that's my worry about a crosswalk sometimes there and the attitudes of the drivers not paying attention, because they're not paying attention, and that's the parents their kids, mm -hmm. right? And so... Uh, I just get astounded when I go through there during that rush. And some days it's okay yes. for the stagger. Some days it's just absolutely a nut bar situation. Well, my other question, if, if City Council would be willing to pay for a crossing guard, I'd take that. <laughs> we're we, we, we're going to move on here with uh, Chris. Thanks for coming. I think the uh, the new parking lot that's been put in for the park has also made it more difficult. Is that... Uh... Uh, the previous parking lot that was available did have a roundabout, so parents pulled in and came out. And now there's going to be two separate parking lots, one just for the teachers that's not uh, accessible to parents. And the second one will be just a pull-in and we'll have a single bank of parking, so it won't be where they could come in and turn around. Um, you know, my kids went to the school. I, I still go to the school to coach wrestling and I, I see what it's like after school and it's crazy um, and so I would be I mean I hear what, what Mayor Stewart is saying but I think um, you know that's a very busy street it's very fast the, the grid system that we're trying to achieve in other parts of our city isn't in this area so you get people doing U-turns in the middle of the road because otherwise it's going to take them five minutes to to turn around to get to where they uh, where they have to go back to. So, um, I, I I like the idea of a crosswalk. I like the idea of the, the pedestrian bulges, and I, I really like the idea of an LED pedestrian controlled um, light system like they have at Rocky Point. I think uh, in a case like this, where there's so many kids being dropped off on that side of the street. Um, it would really, I think, make sense to uh, to look at something like that there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess Mr. Mooney is taking note of all the suggestions as this is going to be going to you. We'll just continue with the last two speakers. Greg? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. And, uh, yeah, like everybody, I've, I've spent time down in that area and previously on the traffic calming committee, so I... I understand the concerns. Um, to uh, to uh, Mr. Mooney, um, you've done some work on this, and I, I know you've done work around other schools, and we've done some things with uh, new signage, and, and we've even looked at possibly in the future putting uh, uh, markings on the road in advance of the crosswalks, because uh, like some of the previous speakers, um, I, I recognize that mid-block crosswalks do also bring challenges, and I'm just wondering that while you're looking at this uh, possibility, 
Are we also looking at some of the ways that we can make, if we go with a mid-block uh, crosswalk, how we can make it safer, either by putting uh, decals on the road, possibly traffic bulge or a, a bulge, raise it up, or different markings on the on the crosswalk uh, flagging, if there's anything else that we can do that would potentially make a, a potential crosswalk safer? Right. And maybe Mr. Rooney? I, yeah. Pardon? Or I, I'm I'm fine just I, I, you know I'm fine just leaving that as just okay. asking you to just look at that through the chair, Councillor Hodge. There are a number of initiatives we're looking at in terms of overall school safety, primarily the elementary school as opposed to middle school. But any best practices that we would identify out of that comment <coughs> markings, uh, signage, uh, and so on, uh, we would uh, look to adapt to all schools. Good. Okay, Thank so it'll you. be part of your study. Thank you. Uh, Dennis? Thank you. Um, not to repeat what was said, but uh, I think uh, Councillor Wilson touched on the Rocky Point example, and I think that's a, a really good one that we do. We do have a couple of areas where mid-block crosswalks, if they're going to make sense at all, you know, we got to look at making them safe as possible. I think the Rocky Point example is good. Uh, the question I have is, is more from a Parks and Rec perspective. With the daylighting that's all been done through there, mm -hmm. on the north side of the street, do we anticipate that trail to continue up in terms of whether it be... Uh, a structured one as part of our trail network, or is it just people are moving moving about through it as a as a route? Is there any yeah, insight you can provide? My uh, thank you, Mr. Chair uh, or Madam Chair. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I don't recall that there was any uh, any specific discussion around the extend, extension of that trail. There was some discussion around the extensions to the to the east, if, if Council will recall, but not to the north. So at this point, we had no plans in the parks uh, plan to extend. Uh, the network above that. Okay, then then my ask would be then if, it, if it's not specifically on our, our radar right now, that uh, Mr. Moody, at least while while you're doing your work, perhaps you could take a take a look at that. Do we anticipate there'll be increased traffic? And you know, I don't think we'll see it to the extent of the mid block at, at Guilford for the uh, for the crunch. Yeah. But um, you know, if, if we've got people that are coming from the south up up across the the street and crossing at a crosswalk, that might be safer if if uh, if that adds to the reasoning behind putting putting one there okay okay thank you. thank you very much thank you miss martin for coming forward um we've all heard your concerns and you're in good hands with mr mooney and i'm sure you'll be reporting back to us excellent okay well thank you very much thank and you. i just Thanks wanted to say again. thank you to gabrielle yes, Gabriel. well, thank you very much I told you it'd be easy yeah it was easy and they were you know very good next item please Thank you, Madam Chair. Item four is a delegation from the New View Society. I'd like to invite Ms. Tiffany Malias to please come forward. Ms. Malias will be speaking to their strategic vision, community health through mental health. Hi, um, thank you to the mayor and councillors for having me today. Um, oh. Thank you. Um, I have come into contact with, cross paths with a number of you over the last few months. I'm very new in this role. Many of you will have been familiar with Jill Calder, who was the executive director prior to um, March of last year. Um, unfortunately, she passed away quite tragically, and uh, the society has been, to its strength, very resilient in dealing with her passing and continuing to serve the members in the time between uh, March last year and I came on in uh, August of last year. Okay, thank you. We um, have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, so uh, the goal of me coming in here today is really to introduce myself for those of you that I haven't uh, met before. We've recently done a strategic planning process with our board and management team and I wanted to explain uh, the priorities that we have for the next three years and try to find some alignment with the City Council, so Port Moody, Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam uh, that we serve members within the whole of the Tri-Cities. So um, hopefully I can get this to work. Great. So first thing, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with New View Society, does everyone know New View Society? Okay, so everyone already knows, so I'll be really quick on this. So we're a non-profit organization, so people with mental illness, and we have... Uh, some core programs, which I'll touch on in a second. And we just have a few, is this connected to me? 
Yes. Oh, okay. So we have Andrea, Rick, and June. If you come into our clubhouse, you will see many, many members, just fantastic people who come in uh, and create the culture that we have at New View. And I'm sure many of you have come into contact with them before. Uh, these are just three of them. And we serve the members through four main areas. So vocational employment, community living support, housing and social recreation programming through our clubhouse. There are some stats up there. I don't expect you to be able to read all of those. Uh, if anybody wanted some more detail on any of these areas, I'm very happy to provide it. Uh, and we serve over 600 unique individuals. At any given time, through all four of these programs, we're serving a, a huge portion of people in the community with mental illness. We are specializing in people with severe and persistent mental illness, so those people who really are at need. One of the main things that we do is we serve with uh, psychosocial rehabilitation principles, which means that we focus on person-centered recovery rather than illness-centered recovery, which is what is primarily the focus of the medical model, where they focus on the problem rather than you know what they can't do, what's wrong with them rather than what's right with them. So we want to help people improve their quality of life through their strengths, not through what's wrong with them. So the strategic priorities that came out of the um, planning session that we did earlier in the year were internal systems and structures. So this is a lot of consolidation of what we've got going at the moment. Policies and procedures, record keeping, administration, risk management, all of those sorts of things. Um, and a big one for us at the moment is IT infrastructure. The second one is access to housing. So we own six properties at the moment. All of them are in Port Coquitlam. They, we totally serve uh, 51 residents currently, and I would love to expand our uh, ability to house people in a few different ways. Firstly, I would love to be able to have properties that are in Coquitlam and in Port Moody, as well as just in Port Coquitlam. Um, and we are currently serving people that we can within the housing facilities that we have. So we are not actually serving everyone in the full continuum of care. They're, the lodges have the full-time care, and we have the people who are living semi-independently. But there's a block in there in the middle that at the moment there's not really facilities within the Tri-Cities to house them. So we would love to expand access that way. Um, and whether that means through properties that we run and manage, whether that's through partnerships with other organizations, um, and whether that's mixed income housing, that sort of thing that I know that there's been a lot lot of um, affordable housing strategies. The Coquitlam one is you know, one of the, the leading ones in the area in Metro Vancouver. And so potentially there are other ways that we could fit in with the affordable housing strategy that you have and also serve our members. Uh, the third strategic priority we have is funding. You will hear this from every single nonprofit ever that you come into contact with. Uh, we're obviously looking for more and different ways to get funding. And then New View Core, aka the Warm Fuzzy. So for us, this is really the culture of the organization. It's a lot of maintenance. We want to continue doing what we're currently doing and keep the heart that makes New View a heart. And there's not a lot of activity around this necessarily, but it's something that is a priority for the organization. Organization. So we made sure that that was outlined in our plan. So the big piece of uh, why I'm here today is that we need your help. The main areas that we're looking for help are in funding sources, so whether that's council itself or whether that's you know of grants that may be looking at some of these priorities or you know of organizations that might want to partner with us. Our IT infrastructure at the moment is a big priority. It's quite dysfunctional the way that it is right now. We have good hardware. We got a big donation of computers last year. So our hardware is up to date, but our actual systems are not. Just as an example, we don't have calendars that interact with each other. So if somebody sends me an appointment, I don't actually get it. I can't see when my staff are in different places, if they're in the office or not. Um, we don't have a filing system where people can shared, have a shared access to files, which in any office is they're really, really basic IT um, functions, which we just don't have right now. So uh, that's one thing that we're looking for funding for. Peer support programming. Peer is uh, evidence-based programming, so it's offering supportive roles to people with mental illness to help their peers, and there are proven benefits on both sides. 
housing consultation fees. So for us to move forward with a real estate strategy and looking at our options to expand that access to housing, we're looking at funding to cover the initial upfront work, feasibility study, needs assessment, that sort of work. And we want to get a fundraiser in, but nobody funds fundraiser salaries and we don't have enough extra money in the budgets from the contracts that we have with Fraser Health and BC Housing to cover that salary right now. So I'm asking the board to raise the money to get the person to raise the money, but we need to get that person in place first. Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up soon here. Sure. Um, potential partnerships. So we're looking for people to um, partner with, whether it's organizations, whether it's council, and then board nominations. So we're looking to have a half of our board turnover um, in June at our AGM, and we're looking for people with specific interest and skills area in finance, fundraising, law, and real estate. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming and introducing yourself. This society has been around a long time, as yes. I have. So I, I get to know <laughs> a lot of the folks that have worked on it. Um, council can discuss this in, in uh, you know, another forum when it comes to budget and things like that. And thank you for coming forward. For yes. Go ahead. Um, thank you for, for coming. Uh, you, missed, you missed some of the other programming, like parent to parent and stuff, the things that the others have participated in. We really value those. On the housing side, have you, you mentioned housing consultant fee and housing, essentially the redevelopment side. Have you been in touch with a group like uh, Catalyst, for example? Yes, we have actually. Catalyst isn't taking on any more work at the moment. Um, <laughs> they have been recommending them to everybody. Okay, yes, they were actually interested, but they have introduced us to somebody at Van City um, who may either fund that for us or take it on as in-kind services. So we're having those conversations. We're just not at the point where anything's been secured at this stage. Well, I've seen your housing. I'd, lo I'd love to see some of it in Coquitlam. Uh, yes, so would we, yeah. yeah Thank yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Next item, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item five is the new PRC Recreation Guide. We have introductory comments by the General Manager of Parks, Recreation, and Culture Services, and the report is before you for information. <laughs> Move receipt. Second. Favor. Sorry, I'm reading the next item. For the presentation on its operation. I'm uh, Just very quick. I, I, this is. Um, uh, it is a substantial. Uh, Piece of work that it's more, there's a lot of um, organizational kind of improvements in this in this body of work. I just wanted to highlight for council um, uh, this report is really for information, uh, but council should be aware that we are changing the way we're producing our, our guides. We've looked at the importance of how to do it, uh, a bit more progressive. We've looked at uh, best practices in this area. There's a number of factors identified in here as to what's driving the new methods. Um, Vin Trong, who's one of our managers of recreation, has uh, um, led this initiative. Initiative. We just wanted to highlight with, for council uh, this. Uh, it is a business improvement, so it's important to get some of these pieces of work done as well. And um, the hope is that over time we'll be continuously improving this and, and and augmenting it with online, you know, improved online services. There's a whole range of improvements being done on the online side as well. Um, and this is really just uh, information to council. I wanted to point out to you that um, in the building that I live in, there's one of these right out front by the mailbox. And the beauty of it is there's lots of people that always think, gee, I should do that. Yes. But they never actually would go online and look it up. But then this is there, and I know a whole group of them now that are attending a few things that they're doing. So it does have its place. Yes, it, it really does. And we do feel that um, the new format will actually encourage people to look outside of their own specific area and, and perhaps find, oh, I didn't know that was happening. I should take advantage of that. And, and so our, our hope and actually the talking to other communities, this is actually what happens is you, you begin to kind of cross-pollinate people's interests uh, around other things they might not have been specifically uh, uh, targeting, but that is nonetheless offered. And that information all of a sudden is something they're aware of. Yes, uh, speaking of cross-pollination, um, the, the city funds uh, four, five, five um, cultural-type groups. 
that offer programs of their own, um, some of which aren't as well known as the programs that we offer directly. Um, what sort of work has gone into coordination and uh, cross promotion? Um, answer that. Yep. I'm interested in that. Um, so we, uh, we we met with the uh, cultural group as well when we did this uh, process, went through this process. And so currently what will happen is that each of them will get one page of their own in the guide. And so how they want to promote what uh, activity or events they have in there, um, they can do that at their discretion. And so each of those groups will get their own page in the, in the new mock guide. That's good to hear. It might not be sufficient in, in for some of the groups, but at least it gets the it highlighted gets ones, Highlight, yeah. has the website that they can go to for That's more correct. information, things like that. So, um, okay, well, it's good that the... How was that opposed to what we was done in the past? Uh, um, it, it's no different. The, the format is still the same, and I think what we're hoping for, and again, depending on the, the, the new software system that comes into play, um, part of the option would be that um, they could click on a link. So if they, the, uh, the user will go through the pages and see that, okay, Plasma Days Art has something going on, and they may be able to click, uh, click on a link that would take them directly to the Plasma Days Art page. Okay. That sounds reasonable. Thank you very much. Okay, Jerry Tanner. Thank you. I think this is fantastic. I just have a question. It's more of a curiosity. I'm sorry if it's covered off in here. But have we ever asked people after they've registered for a program how they found out about it? Um, there, that is part, yeah, that is part of it. Um, I don't have the data with me, but um, we, through this whole process, um, we talk to the call center and all the reg clerks as well. And oftentimes what they tell us is that a lot, you know, and through all the data, but online is the way most people are heading towards. But word of mouth, um, I think as in the report, word of mouth is still the, uh, the number one preferred. And that's what they, you know, through word of mouth, that's why they're signing up. Well, when my kids were younger, I loved having the hard copy because we'd sit down together and circle the ones that were that they were interested in, and then I'd go online to see if there was still room. So it's yeah. both. But, but great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other questions, it's been moved, seconded. All in favor? Thanks, Carrie. Thank you very much. Are you there two other oh, business? No. Beast. OB1 pertains to reminder to local real estate agents and was raised by counselors. Thank you. So it was a really nice weekend. Lots of open houses, and um, I got uh, a call from someone uh, around the uh, open houses that they had gone to, and a couple of the real estate agents saying that these homes could be made into multiple suites in the basement. And I just thought, as the he as we're heading into the spring market. If, as the city of Coquitlam, we have the ability to send a letter, whether it's to offices or perhaps uh, the real estate agents locally, whether we have business licenses for them or how we would do it, just to remind them that we have a one-suite policy in single-family homes in the city of Coquitlam, and um, hopefully we can get ahead of that in a proactive way rather than having to deal with it after the fact. Okay. I will remind you that... Um the agents aren't into, they're individually licensed by the province, but there's just one office and then 60 or 70 agents or less or more work under that one, so you could send it to all the offices. That's what I was thinking. It can also be forwarded to the real estate board, which I think probably is even better. And real estate agents should know better, and uh, that is a problem. Um, Mr. Dumont and then Mr. McIntyre. Yeah, just by way of background, uh this, this came up last year, so at the end of July, we did send out a letter to 900 contractors, developers, uh, real estate agents, banks, mortgage brokers, et cetera, uh, telling them about the uh, one-suite policy. Subsequent to that, we did uh, we ran print ads and digital ads. Uh, we also did an information bulletin in the fall. And in the utility notice that's uh, going out any day now, uh, we do have a section in the notice on uh, secondary suites and one of the things that it notes is again the uh, one suite uh, policy so that will be going out to uh, every everybody that gets a utility notice in uh, in Coquitlam so, and the problem so with there's that, a, a bunch of information does that it say that the fine for having more than one suite is a hundred dollars a day or something like that no it doesn't talk well, about that. that's the only way people are going to pay attention 
Mr. McIntyre. Uh, yes, thank you, and, and good afternoon. Um, as, as John said, there's been um, previous outreach with uh, communication to uh, a number of bodies, including the Real Estate Board, the Real Estate Council, um, and on occasion even taken specific realtors to task on, on these, uh, uh, especially... You reported to the council? Yes, and that they've been advised of that as well, um, where there was actual um, misleading advertising uh, with the listing. Um, um, in this instance here, I believe it was just maybe a, a verbal communication, but uh, we are aware of it, and we, we can take that away. Um, uh, Doug Vance in our building permits area has dealt with this before, so we'll We'll liaise with uh, um, by law enforcement staff if that's the direction of uh, the committee. Okay, so Councillor Zarillo. So um, I did speak to Mr. Vance about this, and he did say that the, the the letter did go to the real estate board last year, and the letter that came back basically was there was because the average every municipality is different that they couldn't make a generalized. Uh, enforcement or notice around it. So I'm just wondering if we could, as Councillor Reed mentioned, perhaps just the real estate offices that have a business license in the city of Coquitlam, if we could send out a letter with the fine information, because there's constantly new, newly uh, appointed realtors all the time. So if we could do that, that would be wonderful. I would like a copy to the real estate council, and I would like the council put on notice what is happening. Uh, Madam Chair, as well, with the um, as one particular uh, building permit application, and as we do, uh, when those um, BP applications are being reviewed, you, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see where suites might find their way in there. So there is markings, there's notes put on the plans. Um, you know, we make the applicant very aware of what the restrictions are. Um, and then also we, we, we put that on the watch list. And so again, between building permit staff and bylaw enforcement staff, there's a, there's a monitoring to make sure that uh, um, impermissible suites aren't being uh, installed. I suggest with the notice that you attach a photograph of a scowling counselor Reed and um, wagging her finger, that, that, that might get more notice, because I, I know that she's very concerned about this. I, I am yeah. embarrassed and ashamed that people in my profession, of which I've been a member of for like 37 years, are still stupid enough that they don't understand the rules of the municipalities that they're selling in. And we have so many rules and regulations in our industry, and for people to be thwarting this just because it seems to be for their financial gain makes me very angry. So I want to jump all over this, and if there's fines that we can make applicable, make them big and make them often. So with that, all in favor? Opposed carried. Thank you. If there's nothing else for the agenda, can we move adjournment? Move. Second. Second. All in favor? Opposed carried. We're done. Five-minute break. Thank you. Thank you for that.